Hey, hey, you're listening to Rising Into Mindful Motherhood. I'm your host, Dr. Katie Wood. I'm a barefoot mama bear, pharmacist, integrative fertility health coach, and lover of all things nature and animals. I'm on a mission to have intentional conversations about the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to fertility, pregnancy, postpartum, and beyond. My mindful guest and I will be talking about struggles, wins, natural wellness, and how we grow and transform as we enter motherhood. My background in healthcare has shown me how broken our medical system is. My own struggles to become pregnant has shown the lack of support for mamas-to-be, the lack of guidance for women to have a nourishing and vibrant pregnancy, the isolation, mom guilt, and all the things we hold after bringing baby Earthside. I want this platform to be a place where women can feel connected, safe and supported to share and hear their stories. A place to use our voice to discuss and advocate about what we need and deserve as mothers. So let's dive in, shall we? So hello and welcome to Rising Into Mindful Motherhood. I'm super excited for our conversation today. I'll be chatting with Sarah, who is a mother of two with one on the way and a beautiful daughter in heaven. She'll be sharing today about her experience with PCOS, infertility, and loss. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on and you know, giving me a space to share my story. Yes, of course. So let's just jump right in. How about you tell us about your fertility journey? Okay, so um, I kind of got diagnosed with um, PCOS when I was young, I was 16. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, they basically just said, here's some birth control. That's it. Just go on birth control. Not really any information about what it is, what it would mean for me in the future or anything like that. So uh, when we started trying to get pregnant, and I came off birth control, obviously, I was having issues due to the PCOS and not having regular cycles. Mm -hmm. So um, we tried for maybe about, well, I think it was a little less than a year. And um, I was referred to see a fertility specialist. And I also had started acupuncture at the same time. And acupuncture was amazing. It actually really helped regulate my cycles. And it was just way, it did way more than I thought it could do. And um, we did uh, a failed round of treatment. And then I, uh, actually got pregnant the cycle after on my own with my son. And then after I had him, um, that was followed by two early losses. And, you know, we kind of did treatment cycles here or there, which was basically, uh, taking letrozole. And then, um, I had to do the injections of the follicle stimulating hormone mm -hmm. and then, uh, a trigger shot. And so we did, um, some failed ones of those, and then one of those um, actually worked, but that ended in a miscarriage. And then um, I got pregnant after a treatment cycle with my daughter, Jasmine. She ended up being stillborn at uh, 32 weeks. And uh, she was uh, diagnosed with a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which means that she had a, um, like her diaphragm didn't fully form. There was a hole in her diaphragm. So it allowed all the organs like her stomach and liver and things like that to move up into her chest cavity, which then like compresses the lungs so they don't fully form. And we found that out um, at 13 weeks pregnant with her. And then uh, later found out that she also had mosaic trisomy 15. And so... Um, it was a really, both of those actually are really rare conditions. And then um, after that, we did fertility treatment again, which was the letrozole and the uh, follicle stimulating hormone again. This was about six months after our loss. And uh, we we're able to get pregnant with our daughter, our second daughter. And we had her. And now um, I got pregnant naturally on my own with uh, this baby. And I am currently 28 weeks pregnant with my pot of gold baby. Oh, wow. That is 
That sounds like a roller coaster ride. So <laughs> just to put it in perspective for everyone, what is the time span from when you first uh, started trying to really now, I guess? Um, so we started trying, we got married in 2011 and we started trying uh, with the fertility specialist in uh, 2012 or 2013. I had my son in 2014. Um, then that was followed by my two losses. And then Jasmine uh, was born in 2018, my rainbow daughter in 2019. And now this baby will be in 2023. So almost, is that almost 10 years? Yeah, like 12 I can't do math. <laughs> like, because, however yeah, many years 2023, that is. yeah, at all, right? When I think the pandemic really chopped off a couple of years. So it really did. That felt like 10 years, like all on its own. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I I just have to, you know, tell you I'm so sorry that you've had to go through all of that. That's just so heartbreak, like so many heartbreaks. Um, so what are some things that you've been able to do to kind of cope with, you know, you haven't given up clearly you've, you've stuck with it and, but it's hard, you know, you have to allow yourself to heal, you know, physically, mentally, and emotionally. So how, how have you been able to cope with that? You know, it's been hard because, you know, I, I always thought, you know, it's, I always feel like it's unfair that anyone ever has to deal with infertility or loss, but I feel mm -hmm. like it's like more unfair that when people have to deal with both. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, you know, I thought that the infertility would be, and that, you know, I thought, okay, maybe getting pregnant is a problem, but once I get pregnant, like it'll be okay. So, you know, that was you know, like you said, that was very challenging. Um, I was fortunate to have um, really supportive family and friends. And after our losses, especially after losing Jasmine, um, I turned to other people in the loss community and it's been amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's full of people who understand exactly how you feel and yeah. don't judge you for it. And, you know, they've been through it too. So, I would say that that is really what helped me get through is um, having them to turn to. And then I also decided that I wanted to help other people who had gone through loss. So I found that helping other people get through it also helped me get through it. Absolutely. Yeah. Having that community to connect and feel seen and heard and, and then also offer support too. That's a really beautiful way to shift such a, an otherwise devastating, you know, experiences that you've, you've had, um, you know, miscarriage alone is painful, but to go through what you had to go through with Jasmine is just unimaginable. I remember my sister, um, her friend had a still birth and I was younger. Um, this was a while ago, but just trying to wrap my head around some, like, how could something like that even happen? It's one yeah, of those things that you always feel like happens to other people. <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't think that it's going to happen to you. And mm -hmm. even when we knew what her diagnosis was and knew that, you know, basically the mosaic trisomy 15 is such a extremely rare thing to happen that the doctors couldn't even really tell me how exactly it would affect her. Because oh, if, if you're not familiar with um, mosaic trisomy, like when, when you hear of like trisomy 18 or 21, which is like the down syndrome and things like that, it means that's a full trisomy where um, every cell in the body has that extra DNA in it. But the mosaic trisomy means not all the cells do, but some of them do. And they, and they don't know like how many or like where those cells are. So basically it could just affect them in, 
you know, so many different ways that doctors didn't really know what that meant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even knowing what, you know, knowing that diagnosis, you know, I still wanted to carry her. I still had faith that she would make it, you know, I just, I didn't think we would end up losing her like that. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. You, you held on to hope for her that it would turn out. Okay. Well, I know that she's watching, watching over you and your family. I definitely think she is. I, you know, I think of her every time I see a rainbow or a butterfly or a cardinal things, you know, I just think that's her letting me know that she's okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think she, you know, watched over her sister, her sister was safely born. And Mm -hmm. I think she's watching over her other sister who will be here in just three months. (laughs) Yeah. So by that point, when you were pregnant with Jasmine, you had had your son already. Yes. So how old was he at that point? He was three. Okay. So he would have been, um, he, he was three at the time and then turned four a couple of months after. So he was almost four. And how was that for you? You know, having to show up as a parent still, um, while going through such a tragic loss. It was hard. Um, you know, after a loss like that, it just, it can be, the grief can become very consuming yeah. and, you know, I, I knew that he needed me, but sometimes it was really hard to be fully present, mm-hmm. but I just did my best to make sure he, you know, got what he needed and did my grieving after he went to bed. <laughs> yeah. You know? Wow. Yeah, just probably taking it day by day. Pretty much. And, you know, he was so young still that he just didn't really fully understand what had happened. Mm -hmm. We tried explaining it to him in, you know, terms that he could understand. We told him uh, we didn't choose to bring him to the hospital after she was born. Um, Sometimes I regret that, but, you know, we make the best decisions we can at the time. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, he knows about her now. He talks about her now. He knows he has a sister that's in heaven. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, definitely at the time he was not understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And then let's see, how long did it, did you allow yourself to kind of heal and grieve before you decided you would try again? You know, we... We knew pretty quickly that we wanted to try again. And, you know, we both felt kind of guilty for feeling it so quickly. But, you know, we we talked about it and we knew that, you know, we weren't trying to replace her, but that we just, you know, we had to leave the hospital like empty handed. And, you know, we we wanted another baby to, you know, fill that gap that we had to come home with. And um we, uh, since I had a stillbirth, you know, I gave birth and I had to go through the postpartum period. Mm-hmm. So, um, I had to wait at least six months. And so at six months, you know, we talked about it and decided we were going to try and we're fortunate that that treatment worked that time, but it's really mm-hmm. hard deciding, you know, that you want to try again, because like I said, you don't want to, you don't want to replace them. Mm -hmm. but you know, you are longing for what you should have. You should, you know, have a baby and you don't, it's, it's Mm -hmm. so complicated. (laughs) It is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then also, you know, making sure that your body had time to heal as well. Um, you know, that was one of the most frustrating parts actually Mm -hmm. is just, I was angry and I was mad at my body and I didn't, you know, I was like, I had to deal with the milk coming in. I had to deal with, you know, the, the, uh, the stretch marks I had gained, the weight I had gained and, you know, just all the postpartum stuff that a normal person goes through, except I didn't have a baby to make it better. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I was, I had a hard time looking in the mirror for a while because I, it was just like a constant reminder of what I had lost. 
Yeah, I can only imagine. So what, I mean, I know you, you talked about you had a supportive family and, and community, but what else did you do to help get you through that? Did you journal, meditate, um, pray, you know, prayer? What, what was something that really helped kind of pull you out of that or at least keep you afloat while you were dealing with, with that postpartum um, phase? I think the biggest thing for me was writing. Writing, okay. I actually started um, a blog at the time and I just wrote everything out that I was feeling and I shared it. And um, I don't know how many people were actually reading it, but um, I did get you know some supportive comments. And um, I found that just writing it all out and sharing it just helped get it all out there. Mm-hmm. And getting it out there, you know, other people reached out to me like, oh, I've had a loss too. And it was, it helped me connect with other people who had been through it too. Yeah, that's such, such a powerful form of expression and really releasing your emotions is getting it out on paper. So that's beautiful. Do you still write today? I do. Um, I've kind of changed what I write about now. Um, I write about a lot of uh, pregnancy loss stuff now. Um, but I actually started, um, it was, I, so for my maternity pictures with my, uh, rainbow daughter, I had a a rainbow colored skirt that I wore. Mm -hmm. And so I decided after she was born that I wanted to, uh, send it out to other lost moms. So they would take pictures with the skirt and then they write up their story and then like the stories are shared. So I share a lot of those on my blog now and I've had uh, 190 stories that I've shared so far of people that have all worn the skirt and shared their lost story. And I found that it's really helped to, to build that community and to connect with all the other lost moms. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, that that's really like making a ripple effect in, into the community. And, and I think allowing other moms to know that it's safe to share and safe to talk about this topic because it's not talked about enough. And I love that you bring so much of it to light. I mean, that takes a lot of courage to do that especially to to show up so like real and raw and and just wearing your emotions on your sleeve it's definitely hard at times and uh I know you know I've told my story a lot of times now but I still get emotional telling it and uh I know that you know some of these women that have participated that for some it's their first time that they're ever really telling their story and some have told it before, some have never told it, some have told it, but not in great detail. So, you know, it's just various stages of grief that all the women are in. And so many of them have said that it was a very emotionally hard process, but that it was also incredibly healing at the same time. And so, you know, that's why, that's what keeps me going with it, because I know that I'm four years out from losing her and you know, grief doesn't go away. It's always there. It isn't like it was at the beginning. It's not like every day is a sitting at home crying day, but you know, the grief is still there. And uh, I just think it's good to help other people get through their grief too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much stigma around it and shame as well. I mean, just, just kind of like with infertility, you know, even for myself, when I was struggling to get pregnant, I didn't even share it with my family. I kind of just kept it to myself because I just felt like, you know, something was broken inside of me, you know, and that sometimes a sense of shame can, can, can come up with that, but that's not, you know, our bodies are not broken. Right. 
I went through that too. (laughs) When you, you know, go through the infertility, it's just like, why can't my body just do what it's supposed to do? Mm -hmm. You know, like the one thing that it's supposed to do as a woman and you can't do it, you know, it's very frustrating. Yeah. And in my community, I have a private Facebook group where I support women trying to get pregnant and a lot of them have had miscarriages, some of them multiple miscarriages. So, you know, they're almost afraid to get pregnant again, even though they want to get pregnant. And then when they do get pregnant, they're frightened that it's going to happen again. So how, you know, how have you dealt with that in the past and even currently with, with the pregnancy you have right now? Yeah, it's pregnancy after loss is a whole different, uh, whole different thing. <laughs> you know, loss, it, it takes so much from you and it's, it's, you know, I don't, it's hard to put into words almost, but it takes a lot of the joy of the pregnancy away from you. You can't just, oh, like I saw a heartbeat, like, okay, that's exciting. But what if at the next appointment I don't? Or, you know, it's like you're always waiting for the bad news to come at any mm-hmm. moment at the next appointment or, you know, whenever. And it's uh, it's really hard. And I just had to take it one day at a time. And I had to tell myself, OK, right now you have no reason to believe that there is anything wrong. Just, you know, try to get through it. And then once I started uh, feeling my both of the kids with both pregnancies, once I started feeling them move more, it's a little bit more reassuring because you can feel them moving and you know they're there. But um, it's definitely hard and it's kind of hard to believe that you're actually going to end up bringing a baby home. Like with this pregnancy, even though I have two living children, I still I still haven't bought like some of the things I should buy for her, like her car seat or things like that. It's, it's too scary to buy it. And I'm, you know, three months out, I have to do it at some point, she needs it. But it's still just hard to believe, even though I see her on the ultrasound, even though I feel her moving, I still part of me doesn't believe that she'll actually be coming home. That, that must be really, really difficult to to have to, to navigate and go through. You're right. It does steal that joy that you can have. And I've, I've seen women say like, I'm optimistically like pessimistic or something like that. You know, (laughs) like one day you might feel really optimistic and then the next day you could be ridden with just fear and anxiety. Um, I know even for myself, just like, okay, it took me this long to get pregnant and then it's just like okay worrying about anything that happened during the pregnancy and with birth and and then it dawned on me that okay well even when I have this child I'm gonna be worried about them every second of every day like this I think this, this worry is just um always going to be a part of my life now um so yeah um I agree with that Uh, as soon as I think I let out like the biggest sigh of relief when my rainbow daughter was born I mean I just cried because I'm like oh my gosh like she's here and then like you said the the worry after that started of oh my gosh is she still breathing at night is she still you know so I think the worry never stops as moms it just changes yes it shifts and changes and then once they're old enough to be out on their own, will be worried about different things. Exactly. <laughs> so how has your pregnancy been now? Do they keep a closer eye on you? Do they take extra ultrasounds or testing or what does that look like? Um, I get a little bit extra. I see um, my OB the regular amount of times. And then I also asked if I could see um, an MFM again, which I saw with my rainbow daughter, which is a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Um, so I was seeing uh, them monthly, but after my 20 week uh, ultrasound where everything looked normal, uh, they said that 
I don't really need to come monthly, but that he would see me in two months, basically more for my reassurance. He says mm-hmm. he doesn't see anything that would indicate a problem with the pregnancy or the baby or anything. And so I have actually that appointment on tomorrow, actually. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm thinking that after that one, they're probably going to dismiss me. <laughs> and I don't like that. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's both good and bad because it means they don't see anything wrong and don't need to see me. But mm-hmm. for my peace of mind, I would rather get the extra monitoring. So yeah. we'll see what they say, I guess. Yeah. So maybe just voicing that, you know, for my, my own stress levels and sanity, it might be, maybe you can space out your, your check-ins, but not completely like, okay, we'll see you when you're ready to give birth. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I, with my, uh, with my rainbow daughter, um, I saw the MFM too, and I think it was about this point or maybe, maybe about 30 weeks they dismissed me because I wasn't having any issues. So the, the monitoring with them stopped about, about the same time when I hit third trimester. So mm-hmm. um, like I said, it's good, you know, that they don't foresee a problem. And I think with my situation, it wasn't anything that my body did to cause the loss. Like I didn't go into premature labor or have an incompetent cervix or anything like that. It was based solely on a rare fluke chromosomal issues she had yeah so I think that because of the circumstances of the loss they don't and and since they don't see any of those signs in this baby that they don't feel the need to see me anymore Mm -hmm. yeah and this is you know it's hard to accept but sometimes it makes you wonder you know did you go through that for a reason? Did that help your path in life? You know, I've wondered that. I mean, I've done a lot of things because of my loss. Yeah. And um, a lot of things to help other people. And I, yeah, I've, I've had that thought cross my mind. You know, you hate when people say everything happens for a reason, but right. sometimes you still think it like, okay, what if there actually was a reason, even though the reason sucks, you know, mm-hmm. I'd rather have my daughter, but you know, I, I'm really proud of the stuff that I've done in, in her honor. Absolutely. And, and she's proud of you. I'm reading a book called spiritual fertility, and I'm probably not going to say it exactly how she said it in the book, but she touches upon how some babies are just so pure that they cannot manifest in this world. Um, I'll have to try and find that little excerpt and send it to you, but it's, it's kind of a really beautiful way of looking at it, you know? It is. Yeah, that's definitely very a very beautiful way to think of her. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I know you have a website journey for jasmine.com. Yes. Could you tell me a little, me and the listeners, what your website is about, what types of maybe resources or support that they could find on there? Sure. Um, So I, like I said earlier, I have all of the um, rainbow skirt stories on there. Oh, and yeah. I have um, other other um, pregnancy loss stuff, um, like books you can read about loss, songs that were written about loss, um, ways you can honor your loss, just various things related to um, pregnancy loss in general. Um, and then I have some stuff about infertility and um, pregnancy in general, getting pregnant again after a loss, all those things that are related to loss, (laughs) but yeah, I have all, um, 190 stories on there and it's, you know, some of them have been through infertility. They've all been through different kinds of loss. So chances are that, you know, people will find somebody who has been through something similar to what they have, maybe not exactly the same, but similar. Right. Yeah. We all have our own unique stories. 
Um, none are alike, that's for sure. Yes. So is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with? Any advice, words of encouragement, or anything that you want to touch upon um, towards the end of this? I think the most important thing is to know that it's okay to grieve your loss. And you can grieve in however you need to grieve in whatever way you need to grieve. And it doesn't matter if you were four weeks along or 40 weeks along, or if your baby had already been born, that your loss still matters and your baby still matters. And, you know, you have a right to grieve that. So many people are just told, oh, you weren't far enough along. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't a real baby or, you know, whatever things people say that are completely insensitive. And I just, I don't want people to think that just because you weren't far along that you're not allowed to have grief or to feel sad about your loss because your, your loss matters and your baby matters and your story matters. Absolutely. And that's actually, that's something I see come up a lot when people have chemical pregnancies. Yes. You know, I had one of those. Yeah. Or they feel, or they've been told by insensitive people that, that's not even a true pregnancy, you know, but it is, and it's totally valid to, to, and you should grieve, you know, especially if you have been trying and you see those two pink lines or the positive tests, you know, like the intention was there, the love was there. So, so I think that those are wonderful words to end with. Thank you so much for sharing your courageous and resilient story with us today, Sarah. I'm so happy to have had you on. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking with you and you know, getting a chance to share it all. I hope it helps somebody listening. I'm sure it will. Thank you for tuning in today. Make sure you follow and leave a rating so we can connect with more mamas. And I will see you on the next episode.